Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pusenet Excel International GCSE Biology Paper 2B for June 2022. This is the Part 2 video. Upload the link to the Part 1 video below the description box. Let's begin with the first question. Question 4 says the diagram shows part of the human urinary system. We can see the kidneys. We have part labeled A as well as B. They ask, name the structures labeled A and B. A is the ureter and B is the bladder, as I have written them here. The next part says, the diagram shows a kidney nephron. Now, on this kidney nephron, they've labeled region X, they've labeled region Y, as well as region Z. So, let's continue to the next part. Here they say, the table shows the relative concentration of glucose and protein in the areas labeled X, Y, and Z on the diagram. So here we have in the table substance as well as relative concentration in arbitrary units. We can see for proteins, in area X, the concentration is 100, while area Y and Z have concentration 0. In glucose, in area X, we have 100, while in area Y, we have 50. Yet in area Z, we have zero. So the first question is asking, explain the difference between the concentration of protein in area X and the concentration of protein in area Y. So area X has a concentration of 100, while area Y has a concentration of zero. It is because proteins are larger molecules that could not be passed from this region to the other region. So I say, proteins do not pass through the basement membrane, or you would say from area X to area Y, because they are large molecules. The next part they say, explain the difference between the concentration of glucose in area Y and the concentration of glucose in area Z. Referring back to the table, we are looking at this area and this area. Here we have a concentration of 50, but here we have a concentration of zero. The reason for this is because glucose has been reabsorbed by active transport back into the blood. So I said, Area Y shows a glucose concentration of 50 units, while area Z shows a glucose concentration of 0 units, because glucose is reabsorbed back into the blood from the proximal convoluted tubule by active transport. So let's continue. Here they say, when the body becomes dehydrated, the concentration of urine increases. Explain the changes that occur in the body that lead to the production of concentrated urine. Inside our bodies, we have receptors, and for water, we have osmoreceptors. These detect the changes in the concentration of blood or the salt concentration in blood. So I said, osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus detect the increase in salt concentration of blood. Then, the pituitary gland will release antidiuretic hormone into the blood. This hormone will cause increased permeability of the collecting ducts to water reabsorption, and so more water will be reabsorbed into the blood, and that will lead to production of more concentrated urine. So this brings us to the end of question four. Let's continue to question five. Question five. Pineapple juice contains a protease called bromelain. A student uses this method to investigate the digestion of solid gelatin protein by bromelain. So they place solid gelatin protein into a test tube up to a height of 5 cm. Then they mix 5 cm cubed of pineapple juice with 1 cm cubed of pH 4 buffer. Using this buffer solution is going to ensure that the pH remains about 4. Then they place 1 cm cubed of pineapple juice and the buffer solution on top of the gelatin like displayed here. Then they leave for one hour in a water bath set at 37 degrees, so this is to maintain the temperature. They measure the height of the solid gelatin and use it to calculate the volume of gelatin that has been digested. This experiment is repeated three more times, and the diagram shows part of the student's method. So this is the method used. Let's go to the next page. The table shows the student's results for the volume of gelatin digested at pH 4. So these are the different numbers of the test tubes or the tubes used. And we can see these are the different volumes of 
gelatin digested in centimeters per tube. The first question here is asking us to calculate the mean volume of gelatin digested in centimeters cubed, and they want you to give your answer to two decimal places. So in order to do this, I had to find out which results are going to be in agreement. So if I compared this and that, I saw there was no agreement because the difference between these two, as you can see, was that. The difference between this one and this one is 1.35, and the difference between that and that, it is 1.28. So these differences are really big to consider those results concordant or the results to be agreeing. However, when I use number one, number three, and number four, the differences are really, really small, and those results could be agreeable or they are in agreement. So I use those to calculate the mean. And again, at the start of the question, if I can take you back slowly, they said, repeat the method three more times. So I'm going to use the three results that do agree. Let's go back. So using 0 0.55, 0 0.54, and 0 0.61 to calculate the mean, since they are three values, I had to divide by three, and my answer was 0 0.57 to two decimal points. The next part says state what substances are produced when gelatin protein is digested. Because this is a protein, of course, digestion is going to lead to production of amino acids, so I just wrote amino acids. Continuing on, a student repeats the investigation with different pH buffers. The table shows their results. So here there is pH 3 until pH 11, and we can see the mean volume of gelatin digested. We see there is an increase as we move from 3 to 5. However, as you go to 7, there is going to be a decrease. So it means the optimum is around this area. The optimum could be between pH 3 to pH 7. So they say give two variables that students should control. When you're changing pH, of course, the temperature has to be controlled. The concentration or the volume or the height of gelatin has to be controlled. The volume of the pineapple juice, remember this contains the enzyme, that has to be controlled as well. The surface area of the gelatin has to be controlled, incubation time and so on. There are so many things you would have written here. The next part says, explain the effect of changing pH on the main volume of gelatin digested. Here we have to look at the table. And as you can see, moving from here to here, there is an increase. While as you increase the pH, there is a decrease. So I said increasing pH up to pH 5 leads to more volume of gelatin digested. pH 5 is the optimum pH. And I had to put this in brackets based on the data. Based on the data. If you do my experiment, maybe it may not be pH 5, but based on the data provided in the table, it looks like pH 5 is the optimum pH. And then if you increase to pH 7 and above, that leads to a lower volume of gelatin being digested. And this is because the higher pH denatures the enzymes by changing the shape of the active sites. That means the enzyme substrate complex will not be formed, so digestion will not occur. Moving on, describe how to test for the presence of protein. If we are testing for presence of protein, we use burite reagent. And the observation will be, if it turns purple, then proteins can be confirmed. This brings us to the end of question 5. Let's continue to question 6. Question 6. Beta thalassemia is a genetic condition caused by a mutation in a gene for hemoglobin. People with better thalassemia produce less hemoglobin and fewer red blood cells than people without the condition. Explain why people with better thalassemia may experience severe tiredness. To be able to answer this question, we have to go back to this information here. They say they produce less hemoglobin and they have fewer red blood cells. Remember, hemoglobin is contained in the red blood cells and this is used in the transport of oxygen around the body to the muscles. If they're talking about severe tiredness, it's because the muscles are not receiving enough oxygen to carry out sufficient aerobic respiration for the production of ATP. So I said, due to production of less hemoglobin and fewer red blood cells, their muscles receive less oxygen, so there'll be less respiration taking place, leading to less ATP. You would even say less aerobic respiration taking place, and less ATP will be produced. The next part says a new treatment for beta thalassemia has been developed that edits the hemoglobin gene. 
These are the steps in the treatment. Remove blood stem cells from a patient's bone marrow. Put a strand of RNA and an enzyme into the blood stem cells to correct the hemoglobin gene. Then use drugs to destroy the patient's remaining bone marrow cells. Replace the patient's bone marrow cells with the modified stem cells. The modified stem cells that are in the bone marrow now produce red blood cells containing sufficient hemoglobin. The strand of RNA used in this treatment is complementary to one strand of DNA in the hemoglobin gene. Give the best sequence of RNA that is complementary to this sequence of DNA. Since this is a DNA strand, adenine will be complementary to uracil in RNA, so this corresponds to uracil, that's to uracil, and thymine is going to be to adenine, guanine to cytosine, the same here, cytosine to guanine, guanine to cytosine, guanine to cytosine, cytosine to guanine, thymine to adenine, cytosine to guanine, and adenine to uracil. So the RNA strand will be like that. Moving on, protein synthesis of the modified gene will produce hemoglobin. Describe the stages of this protein synthesis. Now, protein synthesis contains transcription as well as translation. We know that transcription takes place in the nucleus as DNA is used to produce messenger RNA. The produced messenger RNA then leaves the nucleus through the nuclear pore into the cytoplasm where it binds onto the ribosome in order for translation to occur. So I said, DNA is used to produce messenger RNA through the process of transcription that occurs in the nucleus. Messenger RNA moves from the nucleus to the cytoplasm where it binds to the ribosome to be used to produce the polypeptide. During the polypeptide formation, the transfer RNA with the anticodon corresponding to the codon on the messenger RNA brings the amino acid to be added to the growing chain, or you would say to the growing polypeptide chain. Let's continue. The standard treatment for beta thalassemia is a weekly blood transfusion. The new treatment has so far been tested on two patients with these results. Both patients started making large numbers of red blood cells with sufficient hemoglobin, and both patients experienced serious side effects from the drugs used, needing to spend several months in isolation in hospital before recovering. 15 months after the treatment, neither patient required further blood transfusion. Both patients were able to exercise normally without feeling tired. Evaluate the use of the new treatment compared to the weekly blood transfusion. I said, with the new treatment, weekly blood transfusions are not required since patients can produce red blood cells, it is therefore a permanent solution. There is also a lower risk of infection due to transfused blood. However, there are side effects. The patients have to spend a long time in isolation. Also, the sample size used is small just to people. That data may be misleading. These people need to be monitored for longer periods of time, longer than 15 months because side effects could be going on longer after 15 months. Also, the patients have to be tested for a period of time after receiving the treatment. Since the new method involves editing DNA, this could lead to unforeseen mutations, thereby causing cancer. So this has to be considered carefully. This brings us to the end of question six, as well as to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.